Okay, next up we get to talk about everyone's favorite topic, statistics. Yeah, there's actually a lot of statistics in science in general, but also especially in chemistry. Um, I'm gonna simplify this down to just two particles with two positions to be in. So we start out here in A with only, so we start out here in A with two particles inside the same flask that is separated with a valve from an empty flask. And you can imagine if I open this valve, we have a couple choices. The first thing that might happen is blue stays and red goes over to the right side. The second thing is red stays and blue goes over to the right side. The third thing is they both stay. And the fourth thing is they both move over. As it turns out for particles, these situations are all equally likely. Okay, so that makes our probability math relatively easy. If we think about it as just these four possibilities, which it is for two positions, two atoms, the question, what is the probability of having an atom on the left side? So we look in here and we say one, two, three, three, three options out of four have an atom on the left side. What is the probability that they're both on the left side? Well, that's just this one out of all four. So one out of four. Uh, the probability of all, if we, okay, so let's say um, if we added another particle to this scenario, we got to figure out the probability of having all three of them on one side. And in that scenario, you would have more options. I don't like drawing pictures every time I want to figure out probabilities. So it's easier to kind of boil down the, the math, I think. Okay, so this three fourths probability is any atom being on the left side. What if we just looked at say blue? If we just look at blue, how, how many possible times can we have blue on the left side? So there's one here. And there's one here. So two out of four times you end up with blue on the left side, right? Okay, so red would be the same possible probability, by the way. So these are like our facts that we've gotten from the, the diagram. So let's turn that into an equation that we can apply no matter how many particles we have, okay? So here's the way it's working out. If you have two positions, you make a fraction, one over two, that's positions. Okay. Um, and then you're going to, you're going to raise that to the power of that particles you have that meet whatever your criteria are. So um, let's say this one simplifies down into one half, right? So the math there is two positions. There's only one blue particle, right? So two positions raised to the first power. In this one, it's still two positions, right? It's still two positions, but now we want both of the atoms to be on the left, so that's two atoms. So that's where the one fourth comes in. So rather than having to draw out all the possibilities, if we have three particles, I can just go, okay, well, still two positions, but now there's three particles, right? One cubed is still one. Two cubed is what? I hope you didn't say, if, well, people usually say six. Uh, it's eight. So remember cube is different than multiplying. So if we have three particles, there is a one in eight chance uh, of having all atoms on the left. That tells us that there's probably eight different possible combos, okay? Only one of which has everybody on the left. What if we had a mole of atoms though? That's much more realistic, right? You almost never have just like one or two or three atoms. If we had a mole of atoms, it's still only two positions. it in your calculator. What do you get?
Did you do it? I hope you did. Each calculator has a different response to answering this question. Depending how sophisticated the computer in your calculator is, some of them will give you an error. Some of them will say limit reached. Some of them will just give up and say zero. Because the probability of having an entire mole of atoms on the left side in this uh, binary uh, position is very, very close to zero. It's not actually zero, but it is really small. Um, so we're just going to say like approximately nothing, right? So this is, this is a handy way to figure out if you have a certain number of positions and a known number of atoms, what's the probability of any given situation? Everybody on the left side or, you know, everybody on the right side, whatever you want to think about. The bigger the number of particles gets, the less likely it is that everybody's going to stay in one spot or even everybody's going to end up on the other side. That's because things have a tendency to try to spread out. Statistical analysis says everything's going to try to average out. So that concept led Boltzmann to discover an idea called microstates. So a microstate is like if you took a snapshot of any given material and you could quantify the position, the energy, the vector, that means the direction that that molecule is traveling. If you could quantify every single aspect of every single particle in that sample, that would represent one microstate. So in your average sample of, of material, there's almost an infinite number of microstates that things can be in. Okay, because each individual particle can change energy, direction, phase, all kinds of things. Um, so this is a really, really big number, essentially. Um, the relative size of this number gives us an indication of how much entropy a given system has. So Boltzmann's equation essentially is entropy absolute, not the change, but the absolute entropy of something is a constant times the ln of the microstates. And so quantifying these things is, you know, it requires experiment to do that. K is constant, as it turns out. It's called the Boltzmann constant. I like to consult Alexa when it comes to constants in the universe. She's very handy that way. So Alexa, what's the value of Boltzmann's constant? The Boltzmann constant is about 1.4 times 10 to the power of minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Oh, wait, interesting. The Boltzmann constant has the same units as entropy. See, which makes sense because this says they're proportional to each other. Um, just in case you need more sig figs, I'm just going to throw a few extra on there. It wasn't a very precise answer, but I, I actually... Think of it like this, but whatever, you know, two sig figs or I, whatever. Uh, you'll never need more than five, although they have measured it to many more than five sig figs. Um, so essentially the idea here is there's a constant of nature, which actually comes up in several other equations from several other researchers. So that in and of itself is interesting. But um, entropy of a system is proportional to the number of microstates. So if you have more options for energy levels, for positions, for direction of travel in more particles, any of those characteristics will mean you have a higher W. You'll also have a higher entropy. So I said a minute ago that ice has less entropy than liquid water. That's because the liquid has more freedom of movement. It also has a larger range of temperatures. So we talked about this um, as a Boltzmann distribution. So what that means is if you, for example, if you compare a hot liquid and a cold liquid, the hot liquid, so this is population over here, and this will be temp. The population of the hot liquid has a, a well, not temperature really, let's just say energy. Okay, so when you have a hot liquid, so that's red, versus a cold liquid, which of course is going to be blue, you end up with a much wider distribution of energies, right? So some atoms are still low in energy, but 
you have a lot more variability here, a lot more choice in um, energy level. Okay, so this population spreads out when you heat something up, which means you're increasing the number of microstates, okay? Here's what does not happen when you heat something up in terms of energy. Here's, I'm just gonna write that it's wrong, okay? It's not correct. It, it doesn't just make everything have a higher energy level. That's not possible to do. You're always gonna have some particles that are lower in energy, okay? So, that's microstates. And so if you can kind of conceptually understand that changing temperature, um, number of positions. So if we had three positions for our atoms instead of, instead of one, you're going to have a larger number of probable states. So you're going to have more microstates, which means W is bigger. Okay, so this is interesting. So State of matter is something macroscopic, like solid, liquid, gas. A microstate isn't something you can see, all right? It's um, literally a picture of all the qualities of the atoms, not just whether they're a solid, a liquid, or a gas, but also their energy level, where they're going, where they can be. And so microstates depend on all the kinds of energy that atoms can have. There's three different kinds. Universally, everything has vibrational motion, and vibrational motion is actually really cool. We can use this in organic chemistry to study different molecules with infrared spectros yeah, spectroscopy. I almost said spectrophotometry, but that's a different thing. Spectroscopy. Um, it means you're not using light per se, you're using vibration. All right, and so just in an octahedral complex like this, you can have several different kinds of vibration. You can have symmetric vibration of the bonds. You can have asymmetric. This one's dancing. You can have a different kind of asymmetric. We call this bending, okay? A different sort of bend here where these are in sync, but you know these ones are all in sync, but these ones are not. Um, an asymmetric stretch right here. Okay, each one of these things happens at a particular frequency and we can use a device to measure those frequencies and each kind of octahedral complex has different frequencies for these stretches and bends. So you can actually characterize what material you have just by measuring these frequencies. But that's vibration. Everything vibrates. Okay, unless you're at, unless the third law of thermodynamics is being applied, in which case it's not vibrating, no motion at all. But, you know, that's theoretical. The next highest level of energy, of movement energy that a particle can have is called rotational, literally just spinning. My favorite um, animated GIF for this is apparently gone. It used to be um, part of the, the Mox Planck um, website. Um, and I couldn't find a replacement, which is sad. But if you imagine a water molecule, um, they can spin either, so here's your water molecule like that, okay? They can either spin like that, sort of around with the hydrogens kind of spinning around the oxygen, or they can spin this way where the hydrogens are kind of vertically spinning. Um, and so they can actually do that in all three dimensions, okay? So rotation is also a measurable quantity and it does depend on the shape of the molecule and we have instruments to do that as well. Um, they're less used now than they used to be because IR spectroscopy has become so easily attainable and rotational spectroscopy is a little bit, mm, well, it's just less popular, it's more expensive, people just don't do it as much. But it is a kind of motion that things have, and especially gases and liquids have a lot of rotational energy. Solids tend not to rotate very much, um, most solids. Translational motion is the highest energy, and that's what this picture is showing you here. It's what we think of when we think about gas particles, but it turns out gas particles are actually rotating and vibrating as well as translating through space, okay? So translational means moving from point A to point B, um, liquids do that as well, but not to, to the extent that gases do it. Gases do it a lot more. Um, 
So a gas has all three of these. Liquids predominantly have vibrational and rotational with a teensy bit of translational in there. And solids really only get vibrational and very occasionally a little bit of rotational. Some solids are capable of translational movement, but it's really slow, like decades slow. Glass is an example of that, although some people don't consider glass a solid. So in summary, microstates um, increase when uh, you increase the volume because you're giving it more positions. Um, if you increase the temperature, you're going to increase the number of microstates because you're giving things more energy level options. If you increase the number of particles, so the concentration or the pressure, or if you can increase how complicated the molecule is, then you are increasing microstates. When we say things are entropically favored, what we mean and you should write these down, is that entropy is increasing in the following situations. Your microstates are increasing. If you go from um, a liquid or a solid into a gas phase, that is entropically favored. You have more microstates, more choices for energy and position. Um, if you are making something, so you take a solid and you turn it into a solution or you melt it into a liquid. So here's a solution, for example. We would say it's entropically favored. This has way more entropy than this does. Okay, so that connects back to our solubility chapter as well. Things dissolve because entropy. Okay, and so finally, if we have a completely gas phase reaction, it's entropically favored if you get more gas particles as a product. 